Thank you for entering in with us at this time. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump in and we're going to talk about the kingdom of God this morning. And so before I do that, this week I've been praying. Uh, this is the first time I've been up on the stage giving a sermon on Sunday mornings. And so I was praying for the Lord to move in a powerful way. And one thing the Lord gave me this week is he said he has went before me. He has sent his spirit here to engage you, to prepare hearts for the message that we received, right? I prayed for encouragement, prayed for things like repentance, been praying all week for you guys, praying that the message that the Lord gave me that I would be true to and that would have an astounding effect on you, that Jesus would be, in fact, your treasure and that any other treasures in your life that maybe you have sought identity in, that you would relinquish those things this morning. And I was so incredibly encouraged by the love and the encouragement that I've received. I am indebted to this church. As you know, the church is not a building, it's the people. And um, I'm going to get emotional. You guys have loved me incredibly well. You've given me an opportunity to grow up in Christ, to become a disciple of Jesus. You've been patient with me. The leaders have um, continually called me up. They saw things in me before I saw things in me. I remember when they asked me to be an elder, no way, you got the wrong person. I cannot do that. It took me quite a while to wrap my mind around that. Steve Bacosha, one of our elders, wrote me a couple page email encouraging me to step up that he saw that in me. Casey saw that in me. Some of you said you saw that in me, right? I've been able to step up in faith and so I am super indebted to all of you for your love and your encouragement. Even this morning I stepped out I was getting texts. Somebody said they were woke up, woken up in the middle of the night. The Spirit had woken them up, and they started praying for me. And so I feel that peace, right? Because I would be lying if I said I didn't struggle with some anxiousness this week, just thinking through coming up here for the first time. But the Lord really met me in a special place, and I believe it was because he was answering your prayers. And it wasn't just prayers here. I had people in South Carolina. I had people in Minnesota praying for me, my family. My dad was in tears last night. He called and left me a message just saying how proud of me he was. And he mentioned Christ in that conversation, which I can't even tell you how much that warmed my heart. My beautiful wife, Jolene, my son, Gunner, right? I met her at this church. I got married by Casey in this church. Casey married us. My son was baptized in this church. I became a follower of Jesus here. And so the fact that I get to come up here and give this sermon is just, it's an honor. It's a privilege, it's an honor. And uh, I'm excited, I'm excited. I hope you're excited as well. Amen. So this year, your leaders, part of us, we've really searched long and hard. We've prayed and we've fasted. We've come up with a strategic framework. That strategic framework has placed on it outcomes, values. Casey's preached through this thing, right? And there's a couple things on there. It has our mission and it has our vision. And our mission is this, is the Avenue Church is to make disciples who bring the renewing beauty of Jesus to brokenness, right? That's my story, the renewing beauty of Jesus to brokenness. See, I was really broken. I'm going to get into that a little later. Most of you probably know my story. You saw maybe the video a week or two ago. Broken. Jesus met me there, his beauty, and he's transformed and changed me. And so I'm seeing this mission being lived out in my very own life, and I'm seeing it lived out in your lives. And so I am incredibly encouraged this morning. The second part of it is a vision that we see for the church and it's the Lord has given us. It's radical gospel renewal in our homes, churches, and cities. So we want to see this radical gospel renewal, right? But how in the world do we see radical gospel renewal? How in the world do we attain that? I think it's all about what we treasure. I think it's all in what we treasure in our hearts. See, if we treasure Jesus above all else, I believe we can bring radical gospel renewal to not just our homes and our church, but also to our city. We are actually bringing radical gospel renewal. I think if we were to leave this city, the city would mourn. The city would mourn if we weren't here any longer. And so radical gospel renewal is happening in our very midst. We get to see the kingdom take place right here and now and how exciting that is. But I think... There's more. Actually, I know there's a lot more, right? As we continue to make Jesus our treasure, we're going to see more and more and more and more radical gospel renewal. But we can't see it, I don't think, if we don't treasure Jesus above all else, right? We have to treasure Jesus above all 
else. And so what is your treasure? The answer to this question will shape your future, right? What is our treasure? The answer to this will shape our future. How much radical gospel renewal will take place by what we treasure? So let's treasure him above everything else and watch the kingdom explode in our very midst, right? Watch radical gospel renewal as we treasure Jesus. And so today we're going to be mostly in Matthew 13, verses 44. We're going to talk about the parable of the hidden treasure, and we're going to talk, we're going to land in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And so if you have your Bibles or you have your iPhones or whatever it is your Bible is on, if you want to turn to those two spots, we're going to kind of camp out there for the day. And uh, I'm going to jump in. But before I do, I just want to read these scriptures that are tied together. I found this on the internet somewhere, and I couldn't figure out who quoted it, but it's just tying a couple of scriptures together, and it is so relevant for what's happening here today and what's part of my message. And where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. That's Matthew 6, 21. And if your heart is to have the kingdom above all things, then Luke 12, 32 comes true for you. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Right? He wants to give us this kingdom. How awesome is that? So like I talked about, what you love and desire most, you will treasure and seek, is what that's saying, right? Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And so we need to treasure Jesus. If you look at your pocketbooks, John O'Brien says this from time to time. He'll remind us of idols in our lives, right? If you look at where you spend your money, you can find out where your treasure is real quickly. And so what is your treasure? Matthew 13, verse 44 says this. The kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Jesus is saying he is worth forsaking everything in the midst of this parable, right? The kingdom of heaven is worth giving up everything for, everything, right? Abraham gave up his son. He was willing to give up his son for the kingdom, right? There's nothing that compares to the kingdom of God. Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, that indeed I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. In the King James Version, it says dung. I count them as dung in order that I may gain Christ. Quick little confession. So when I picked this scripture, I didn't realize, I should have called John O'Brien this week, I didn't realize how deep the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is. So I got a book, and it's about 500 pages, and it was all about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It's not a super easy concept to explain, but I'm going to take a check shot at it right now, and so just have some grace with me. So the psalm, there's a psalm that says, The earth is the Lord in the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. Right? The kingdom of heaven is that everything belongs to God. And I mean everything. He has created everything. It is all his. It is God's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present rule and reign over everything since the beginning of time. But I want to break it down. The essence of it, the very essence of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is Jesus' redemptive work. It's the God of the universe, the God-man coming into human history and rescuing us. That is the reign of of Jesus. I mean the kingdom of heaven and the rule and reign of God. So as Jesus' ministry begins in the book of Mark, he announces the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What Israel had long awaited, Christ had now inaugurated. He came into human history. He brought the kingdom near and accessible to people. So I'm going to give you this through the lens of the gospel, through creation, fall, redemption, and renewal. See, God created everything, and it was good, right? He created humans. He said it was very good. He placed them in a garden. There was no sin. There was no cancer. There was no criticism. There was perfect peace. 
There's perfect peace within. Adam and Eve had perfect peace within themselves. They had perfect peace with one another. Husbands and wife, can you imagine having perfect peace with one another? Wow, what I would give to have that, right? Perfect peace with one another. And then perfect peace with God, right? They had full access to the God of the kingdom. But Adam and Eve choose, chose to eat of that fruit, right? They chose to disobey God. And this is the fall, right? Matt Chandler says the, the cosmos were fractured at that moment. They chose to eat of that fruit. They disobeyed God and everything in a moment was changed. That perfect shalom peace, gone, right? Gone. Because our forefather Adam sinned, we have all now inherited that sin nature. That's some really, really bad news. God is holy, righteous, and just. We go through this every week, right? And he has to punish sin. And that punishment is death. It's a physical death. One day we'll physically die. It's being born spiritually dead. And we'll be eternally separated from a holy and loving God. That is some really bad news. Nothing we can do about it. It gets worse, right? There's no amount of good deeds that we can do. None. But... Jesus, right? God the Father sent God the Son. This is redemption, right? He came into human history. The kingdom broke in through Jesus. God the Father sent God the Son on a rescue mission for you and I. He lived a life that we could not, right? Sinless in every way. Tempted as we are, yet never succumbed to sin. Went to a cross on our behalf. Was punished, crucified, beard ripped out. The death that we deserved was placed on Jesus, and he gladly took that for us. Let that soak in for a minute. Our filthiness, our hate, our prejudice, our lusts, was placed on our Savior. Jesus took those things for us. He was placed in a tomb. In three days, he arose, right? He overcame sin and death on our behalf. This is redemption. This is kingdom of God. This is the the realm we live in. We live in the redemption, that God has restored things. He has given us forgiveness, these things. But there's a renewal coming, right? The last part of this is a renewal. Like God is going to recreate everything to its original splendor and beauty, right? Sunsets are awesome now. Can you imagine a sunset in the new kingdom? Wow, right? Everything. All tears are going to be wiped away. There will be no more shame. Anybody here battle with shame? It'll be gone. It'll be gone. No more sin, cancer, criticism. Whatever it is, it'll be gone for those who are called according to his good will, for those that have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. This will be glorious, and we should always keep eternity before our very eyes, right? We should always place our eyes upon eternity to think of what's before us, what's ahead of us. Joy in the very presence of God. We will hear that day, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Perfect fellowship once again. Amazing. This magnificence should permeate our lives and our thinking today. We should not wait until we die to discover a taste of all of that. We should be experiencing daily now that joy, right? So the kingdom is essentially Jesus. It's all about Jesus and all that he's accomplished for those who believe. There are many who will live their whole life and never understand to whom all things belong. Some of you today may not even know that truth. There may be some in here today that don't know that everything belongs. You belong to him. Everything in this creation belongs to God. We, me, at one point was out there, right? I didn't have this knowledge until somebody shared it with me, until somebody was kind enough to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with me. I didn't know this, right? It changed everything for me, everything. I'm going to jump back into the parable now. And I want to point out a couple things about parables. And parables talk usually about one main point or two main points. And I want to talk about what the main point of this parable is. And the main point of this parable is that nothing compares to knowing and treasuring Jesus. 
There is nothing in this world that can fulfill you like a relationship with Jesus. Nothing. Believe me, I tried. Anybody else here try? Yeah, right? I still try. I still look to try to find my satisfaction in things outside of Christ. But he is the only thing that brings me that perfect shalom peace that actually can bring me joy, true joy. And so what it's saying is that. What it is not saying, and we could look at it and we could say, well, you can buy the kingdom. You cannot buy the kingdom, right? You cannot buy the kingdom. The kingdom is free. It's a free gift. It's given to us. Isaiah 55 says this. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Isaiah is saying that a relationship with God is free, right? Completely free. It doesn't cost any money. Quit wasting your time. I need to quit. You know, we waste our time looking for it outside. But Isaiah is saying, you know what? You spend all your money on these things that don't really truly satisfy Right? It's not like they're bad things. not necessarily where we spend our money and we go try to purchase things. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about things that we make ultimate things, even good things. Right? We can make good things ultimate things, and we make good things ultimate things. They become bad things. The other thing I want to point out is that Jesus used the familiar to teach the unfamiliar in parables. So Jesus never explained the kingdom of heaven outright because he knew that his Jewish audience knew exactly what he was talking about. The Old Testament talked about all the time about God being a king. He didn't have to explain that. That was very well known to the audience that he was speaking to. The New Testament has a ton to say about the kingdom. In the English Standard Version, which is the version that we most often, this is the one that we give away and that we read from here, The kingdom is talked about 160 times, 134 times in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John alone. And just a side note, when you see kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, it means the same thing that I just explained. In Matthew, he uses kingdom of heaven, but other places he uses kingdom of God. It means the same thing, the rule and reign of Christ. Right? God's rule and reign over everything. And so when you see those, when you're reading your scriptures, just know they mean the same thing. The unfamiliar part of this parable was that his audience, so we know the familiar, the familiar was that God is a king and he has a kingdom. The unfamiliar is this, that his audience was not aware that he was the person who would rescue and redeem his people. They missed it, right? Unless they had special revelation, they had no idea that he was the Christ, right? He broke into human history as a baby. They were expecting a reigning and ruling, majestic, conquering king. Most of them missed it without special revelation, right? And so that was the unfamiliar that he was teaching. It was through death that he rescues and redeems his people. So what are the implications of Jesus breaking into human history? Here are some of the current realities of the kingdom. And so this is part of that redemption that I was talking about. He's pushing back the enemy, right? Sin and unbelief are being defeated in our lives. Is this true of you, right? Unbelief is going away. Sins that seem to own us in the past don't own us anymore. I'm not saying we don't struggle with sin. I certainly still struggle with sin, but the sins that used to own me, they've changed. Right? Drugs and alcohol, they don't no longer own me. Forgiveness. As I said, the removal of shame, right? We live in such a shame based culture. The removal of shame has taken place. In the gospel, our shame is taken, right? It says there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The very Spirit of God dwells within believers, He gives us His very Spirit to lead, guide, and direct us. We are royalty. It says in the scriptures that we are royalty. We've been adopted by the king of the universe. And when you're adopted into a family, everything that is theirs is now yours, right? So we are royalty. We've been ushered into the king's family and everything that is his is ours. It says we're a royal priesthood, I believe, in uh, Peter. 
And so I explained the gospel narrative earlier. We haven't seen this perfect renewal yet. So we live in this redemption, right? The already but not yet is what they call it. So part of this kingly rule is that, is that we live in this time now, this redemption of the already and not yet. The decisive battle against sin and Satan and sickness and death has been fought and won by the king of, in his death and resurrection. But the war is not over. Sin must be fought in our lives, right? Satan must be resisted. We know that. Sickness must be prayed over and groaned under. And death must be endured until the second coming of the King of Kings, Lord Jesus, returns. Until he comes back that second time as a ruling king when he splits the skies, comes back, and he redeems all things. We should always keep that eternity before us, like I said. So what does the kingdom mean for us right here now? There's some super awesome implications. And these implications rescued me this week for certain as I tried to hone in on what God had for me this morning. As anxiousness set in, wanting your approval, wanting to come up here and give this articulate, unbelievable sermon, right? That bringing in anxiousness, the enemy coming after me. These things bless my heart so immensely, right? I needed the gospel desperately this week, but the truth is I need the gospel all the time desperately. The, the problem is I don't always know how desperate I am, right? And that's why we need one another. We need one another to share the gospel with us. I, I can't see my own sin. I'm blind to it oftentimes. I need you to point out my sin. I need you to lovingly come alongside me and say, hey, whoa, you're, you're going in the wrong direction, right? So Jesus has rescued me many times this week. So there's a Piper quote that says this, the worth of having God ruling over you and for you over everything else, it's not hard to see why this is so valuable. If the all-powerful, all-wise God is ruling over all things for your joy and for my joy, everything must be working for your good and my good, no matter how painful. And in the end, God will triumph over evil and all pain, so the kingdom is a treasure. I love that quote, right? Even in our pain, he's working something out for those of us who's been called in Christ. But we have this human conundrum, right? We have this problem. As I said, we live in the already and not yet. We live in the redemption part of the grand scripture narrative. We have this aching in our souls. And I think you know what I'm talking about, right? This itch we cannot scratch. That something is wrong. Right? Cancer. Children dying of cancer. The craziness that's happened in this world. School shootings. We know. Nobody has to tell us that the world isn't supposed to be like this. Even for non-Christians, we know the world's not supposed to be like this. Something is wrong. Right? And so we have this. We long for that shalom peace that was in the garden. It's as if we have a shalom sized hole within our hearts that longs for the garden. And renewal. We look forward to the renewal as well. Right? We sense it. We know it. It is broken and dis in disrepair, this world. We desire peace. And because this world is not as it was designed and brokenness has invaded everything, we look for that peace in all the wrong places. Anybody tracking with me here? Anybody look for peace and joy in places that it cannot be found? How about this morning? Right? <laughs> How about in the last 10 or 15 minutes, right? We do this all the time, right? Nobody is exempt from trying to fill it in. And the truth is that we cannot fill it with anything other than Jesus. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, it says that he said, one of you will betray me, right? And he was talking about Judas, and Judas certainly betrayed Jesus. What did he betray him for? What was the cost? It was 30 pieces of silver, 30 pieces of silver. I looked that up in today's terms and it said it's about 200 bucks, right? Judas, who walked with Jesus, sold him out for $200, right? But the truth is, what did all the other disciples do that night? They, they did the same thing. It wasn't 200 bucks. They did it for their own reasons, but every one of them abandoned them that night, right? They had a cost. We have a cost. We abandoned Jesus. We have a cost that we're going to abandon Jesus. All of us have it. 
right? We all have it. But thank God it doesn't rest upon our sincerity to follow him. It's his sincerity. It's his commitment to us that matters, right? Because we're not going to follow him perfectly. So what is your $200, right? I know what my $200 is. We're going to talk a little bit about it. I'm going to get vulnerable here in a minute. But where do you abandon Jesus? What less, lesser pleasures do you abandon Jesus for? Is it your job? For some of you, it's money. I'm certain of it. Money can certainly be one for me. Is it power and prestige, maybe? Maybe it's pornography. Maybe you're struggling with pornography. Maybe it's a more disciplined version of yourself, right? It's if I just get to be this person, right? Matt Chandler says, if I just, 10 years from now, when I got it figured out and I'm self-disciplined and I got it all going on, like, I got six-pack abs and $100 bills falling out of my pocket. Then it'll be all good, right? (laughs) Nope. So what is it? Material possessions, cars, houses. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's another person, a spouse. It's your kids, right? Abraham had to bring Isaac and be willing to sacrifice him. It was his son. And maybe your son. Maybe your daughter. But everybody, uh, every one of us do it. A father who is a workaholic, who stays out of the house super long hours, is no different than the drug addict, right? No different. He's working towards something that won't bring him ultimate satisfaction. It's causing pain and harm to somewhere else. But the world applauds that. The world would say, man, you're amazing. You got that beautiful big house and the awesome car. Wow, you are awesome. Right? They encourage that. The world encourages that. We can't be blind to that. Before I was a Christian, I would not have been able to say that I was seeking to fill an eternal void of all craziness. Right? I ended up in jail. I tried to find mine in physical fitness, arrest, felony arrest, horrific places and things. I tried to find my satisfaction in a ton of things. But Jesus has radically changed my life. And now it just looks differently, but I still do the same thing. My $200 looks differently than it did before. It's maybe not drugs and alcohol. It's approval, things like this. I searched pretty hard to fill that void inside of me, like an itch I was unable to scratch. Not only was it elusive, but it was also incredibly dangerous. I put myself in some pretty harm's way. But don't take it from me. Right? I want to do a case study on Solomon in the Bible. This person was without a doubt the greatest hedonist or pleasure seeker of all times, right? If anybody's read Ecclesiastes, knows anything about Solomon, this dude did it up. We're going to take a look at Solomon's life as written by himself in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is a book of the Old Testament coined as one of the wisdom books of the Bible. This was basically a scientific study by Solomon to see whether or not he could find fulfillment and shalom in seeking pleasure. Solomon was king of Israel. He was the son of King David. He was the one who was to build God's temple. When Solomon became king of Israel, God offered him anything he wanted, said, anything you want, you can have. He said, I want wisdom, right? Because he asked for wisdom, the Lord said, and you didn't ask for long, or you didn't ask for monies or riches. I'm going to give you that wisdom. And I'm not only going to give you wisdom, I'm going to make you the richest man that ever lived as well. I'm going to give you both, right? Right? He denied himself no pleasure. If you look, he denied absolutely no pleasure. The very opening verse of Ecclesiastes says this. It's a story of a lesson learned, the words of a preacher or teacher, sometimes translated. This really frames up this book as not just a story of a guy and his life, but a lesson learned. There's a lesson to be learned from Solomon. The second verse, the very second verse of Ecclesiastes says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity is vanity. Translated meaningless, meaningless. Marriage, meaningless. Pleasure, meaningless. Right? Material positions, meaningless. All of it. He basically goes on to say that every day is the same. It's like Groundhog Day all over again, he goes into. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear has been filled with hearing. What has been done is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun, is what he says. Every one of us feels this at some level. And so Solomon says, I'm going to seek pleasure like no other. I'm getting after it, right? 
I'm going to do this experiment, this case study. I'm going to find out if I can find true pleasure and happiness in this world. And so he said in, this, said in uh, Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 through 3, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my body how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. He's basically saying, I'm going to devote myself to some serious pleasure. And for days and days, he threw parties. I thought I knew how to throw parties. I thought I knew friends that knew how to throw parties. This dude threw parties for 15 or 20,000 people. He threw parties. Solomon knew how to party. He had Jay-Z, the Rolling Stones. He had them all there, right? He was getting down. Whoever it was that he enjoyed, he said laughter. He brought in people like Seinfeld and Chris Rock, man. He's like, I'm going to laugh, and that's going to give me this fulfillment that I'm desiring. Nope. Sorry. Parties and comedy didn't work either. So he said, I'm going to start building things. That's it, right? I'm going to build things, and then I'm going to find fulfillment. So he says in Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 6, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forests of growing trees. All of this would surely bring him pleasure, right? Wrong. The temple, it took him seven years to build. Everything was in gold. Beautiful. His house, it took 14 years to build. Everything, once again, was in gold. What he ate of was gold. Everything was ornated in gold. Everything. It said back then that actually he had so much gold that silver was like stone or cedar in Jerusalem. Everything. He received 25 tons of gold every year. I'll do the math for you. That's 50,000 pounds of gold every year. That was just the gold that he received. On top of that, he built homes for every one of his wives. I'll tell you how many wives he has in a minute. That would keep you busy. (laughs) All right? He didn't just build a garden, right? Geraniums and daisies, we love them. They're cute. I got a little garden in my backyard. He built national forests, vineyards for himself. If you go to Jerusalem, southwest of Jerusalem, they have gigantic craters in the ground called the Pools of Solomon that he used to water and irrigate his national forests. This dude did it up. And what did he say? This too was meaningless. Solomon was basically like Billy Madison on steroids. Anybody know who Billy Madison was? Adam Sandler played this part where he was a rich kid and he didn't let anything get in his way of indulging in everything. But this didn't work. Sorry, Solomon. So he decided he was going to pamper himself, right? This was the next one. Ecclesiastes 2, 7 through 8 says this. He bought male and female slaves. He had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than anybody before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, as I said. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He made Hugh Hefner look like a chump. Really, man? Seriously. This guy tried it. He did it, got the t-shirt, burnt it up, right? And what did he say? Meaningless, 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 meaningless. He said in 2, 9, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. See, he was incredibly famous as well. People admired Solomon. You can only imagine if you were near Solomon and you're invited to his parties, which I'm pretty sure pretty much everybody was who was Jewish then, You love Solomon. All 500 people on Facebook, likes, right? He would have all their likes. He was popular. Did that bring him meaning and purpose ultimately? Absolutely no. He said it was meaningless as well. He says in 2.9, which I don't want us to miss, it says this. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And then he says these words. I kept a clear head through it all, is what it says in the Message Bible. In the English Standard Version, it says, my wisdom remained with me. 
So I read this book recently by Matt Chandler called Explicit Gospel, and he says this. He comments about Solomon's statement here. He says, he never forgot what his goal was. Never forgot. This was an experiment from the beginning to see if there was anything really of value in the world. From day one, he never forgot it was an experiment. He never lost sight of that. He was seeking meaning and indulgences, so he had the best of both worlds. He could act like an addict. Anybody know what it is to act like an addict here? I do, right? Yet he was able to, in the midst of that, keep his wits about him. He was the wisest guy that ever lived. He could indulge in these debaucheries without losing control. Ask the people that hung out with me if I ever lost control. Actually, ask them if they ever saw me in control when I was drinking and drugging, right? And two sin, he says, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in my toil. He's saying, you know what? The crazy parties, the women, the comedy, the music. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie. I had a good time. And then he says in verse 11, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity. Striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Solomon's words are a vivid reminder of how deep the void goes in each of us. I had the same question towards the end of my addiction. I remember sitting in front of my garage, talking with my brother, saying, it, it, it can't be, it shouldn't be like this. There's got to be something more to life than this. Has to be. I've tried. I've tried really hard to find pleasure in this life. And I found more despair than ever before. What is the meaning of this life? I remember asking my brother. If this is Solomon's conclusion that everything is meaningless, what shot do we have? Zilch. And the powerful irony of this is that God is the author of all these things. God authored every single one of them, right? Partying, gardens, work, money, material things, sex. These are all his ideas, right? God has given us these things to enjoy, but according to his design, that is the key, right? See, in the kingdom of heaven, all things roll past these gifts to a creator that is good and loving and kind. Everything that we have rolls past it. It goes to an awesome God. Every meal we eat, every time we get to participate with somebody, hang out, enjoy a moment, it's a good gift from a loving father. See, true freedom is not getting to do whatever you want, whenever you want. That is not the definition of true freedom as we think it is. It is enjoying things within the parameters of God's design. That is true freedom. Anybody attest to that? Amen. We all seek our own happiness and our own pleasure. It is a motivating factor behind everything we do. Always will be. But it's not the need that is wrong. It is the array of ways apart from Jesus that we search out to meet it. Let's look back at Solomon because scripture says it even gets worse for Solomon. He went from grieving to frustrated to hating his own life. If you have not read Ecclesiastes, I just want to encourage you to do that. He does, though, find the solution, right? There is a solution in Ecclesiastes. He says this in chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. There is nothing better for a person than he, could, than he should eat and drink, and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. What Solomon is saying is that lasting enjoyment experienced by the soul is a gift from Jesus. The ache is overwhelming. We are all groaning. Creation is groaning. We know that to be true. We need a redemption that is way bigger than ourselves. That redemption is Jesus. God gives gifts to all, right? These common graces we talk about. God gives them to all people, whether you believe or not. Both the believer and the unbeliever is living, walking, wearing his stuff, the things that he created. Solomon has done us a great service because Ecclesiastes in the Bible is there so that nothing would be in our hearts but Jesus. So I love old hymns. And there's an old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. 
and it sums it up quite well. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And I wish I could sing because this would be a lot better at this moment. But if I did, it would ruin it. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And so with that, I'm going to start laying in the plane here. And um, I just got a couple points that I want to end today with. And so one of them is, what does it look like to find the kingdom? So some of you may have not found the kingdom. What does it look like to find the kingdom? It's really simple. It's Jesus. Right? It's all about Jesus. It's that simple. It's allowing Jesus' life, death, and resurrection to stand on your behalf. It's trusting in that finished work of Jesus. It's making Jesus your greatest treasure. Don't miss this. If any of you here don't know what it is to have Jesus as your greatest treasure, we're going to have prayer partners up front in a minute. I want you to come forth. I, I think the Holy Spirit, maybe you would be beckoning you. I hope the Holy Spirit is beckoning some of you, if that's where you're at, to come up, receive prayer. Our prayer partners would love to do that with you. Jim Elliott says this. He was a missionary who took the gospel to an unreached people group in South America. And he gave his life for it. He literally gave his life. They killed him, the people that he went to bring the gospel to. But he had a quote, and he has a quote, and it says this. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Right? He paid the ultimate price, but he knew where his treasure was. He was willing to pay that ultimate price. He knew going there that he might lose his life. It was worth it. 100% worth it right? I want that type of faith. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to know that I could die for my faith and be willing to go into the call of action, right? Say yes to Jesus. What does it look like to seek the kingdom? So John Piper, we quote him all the time. Tim Keller is another one, but John Piper says this. He says, become a Christian hedonist. Right? Solomon was a hedonist, but he says, become a Christian hedonist. Because God is most satisfied in us, or most glorified in us, I'm sorry, when we're most satisfied in him. Right? He's most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him. And so how do we seek the kingdom? We do things that stir our affections for Jesus. Right? What is it for you? You know, I know. Man, this week... Every single morning, I get to hang out with my son, Gunner. My, Gunner. my son, Gunner, gives me more joy than I know what to do with. And so we get to hang out for an hour while Jolene goes to the gym, and uh, he loves to worship. He loves to worship with me. And so this week, I can't remember if it was Tuesday or Wednesday, I flipped open the laptop, I turned on the sound bar, cranked it up, and we started doing some worship music. He's on my lap, and we're worshiping. We're worshiping. We're worshiping the Lord, right? Oh, my gosh. Like even right now, I can feel the joy well up within me when I think about worshiping with my son, that one day he's going to have a faith of his own, right? He gets to be raised in a family, in a church like this, that everybody points everything to Jesus. It's not about anything else. It's all about Jesus. My son gets to be raised in this environment around people like you. What a blessing, right? And so what stirs your affections for Jesus? Be a Christian hedonist. Is it reading? Is it scripture? Is it praying? Is it meditating? Is it walking? Is it all these things, right? The spiritual disciplines, whatever it is. Treasure Jesus. Seek these things. Be a Christian hedonist. Indulge like crazy. Abandon yourself to worshiping the king of the universe. Stoke your affections for Jesus. And lastly, I wanted to say is to live a life of faith and repentance. We need to live a life of faith and repentance. Ultimately, the Christian life is about faith and repentance. It's about trusting and believing God in his word. When we fall short of that, confessing those things, right? Repentance is more than confession, but it's not less. It's confessing that we've fallen short of what God would have for our lives. But because of what Jesus has done, it doesn't define us, right? That doesn't define us. We need to repent and turn. And so repentance is just that, is confessing that you've sinned against a holy God, right? Repentance is always vertical before it's horizontal. David said in Psalm 51, right? 
I've sinned against you and you alone, God. Right? Even though he did horrific things to Uriah, Bathsheba, but he said it's against you and you alone, right? Repentance starts here with God. It's mourning when we fall away from what he would call us to. Right? But the end of repentance, that's not the end of repentance. The end of repentance is joy. It's walking forth in joy that, thanks to Jesus, we're delighted in. He loves us. He finds no fault in us. There's no condemnation because of Jesus. We can walk forth in repentance. And so the Christian life is all about faith and repentance. It's believing God. It's trusting Him. It's turning Him, turning from your sin back to Jesus. And we'll do that every day until He comes home, until that renewal happens. We're going to do that every day, right? We've got to practice faith and repentance. What is that for you today? What does faith and repentance look like? to see and know the king of the universe, allow him to rule and reign in your heart in such a way that when you commit sin, it warns your heart. I'd love to say that every time I committed a sin, it warned my heart. Unfortunately, that is not always true. God is redeeming me, progressive sanctification. He's growing me into that person, more like Christ. Right, but I want him to break me over the things that break him. I pray that's what you want as well. I pray that that's what the Spirit is doing in you, is drawing you into this sweet life of just saturating yourself in Jesus, falling deeply in love with him, because ultimately his word says it's his loving kindness that leads us to repentance, right? Condemnation doesn't work. Shame doesn't work. Love does. Perfect love casts out fear, it says, right? It's his love that compelled me to be able to even come up here and speak today. That I don't have to prove myself because of what Jesus has done, I'm fully delighted in. You guys all love me. I got people keep saying, I love you. But even greater than that, the king of the universe loves me and he delights in me and he sent his son for me and he died for me. And so I was able to come up here, not with perfect peace, but I had peace, right? Because Jesus was washing over me. Allowing the gospel of Christ to wash over you and draw you into repentance. So what is keeping you today from experiencing that? I want that to set in just for a minute. What is your 200 bucks? Where do you look to find identity and purpose outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where do you need to repent? What do you need to do to stir your affections to Jesus? See, in just a moment, we're gonna, I'm going to actually call up our prayer partners now. It's about that time. It looks like it is that time. Prayer partners, if you'd come up, and they're going to be ready to receive you. Whether it's you want to receive Christ for the first time, you want to lay down that $200, I want to encourage you to come up and receive prayer this morning. I pray that the Lord would be the treasure of your heart. He is worthy, worthy, worthy of that. And so as we close, I just want to say what an honor and a privilege it has been. And I want to give you all a benediction and send you on your way. But I want you just to rest in that for a second. What is your 200 bucks? What is it this week that's what is it in this, maybe in this moment that's keeping you from treasuring Jesus above all else? Right? And ask yourself that question all week. You should be asking, we should be asking ourselves that question all the time. What is keeping me from that fulfillment, that, G, that peace that Jesus wants so desperately for me to have? What is it? I'm going to pray and then I'll give you guys a benediction. Father, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be up here today, Lord. I'm thankful for the work that you've done in my life. I'm thankful that you didn't leave me where you found me. That, Lord, you have redeemed me. You've called me by name. And that you even use me to advance your very kingdom. And, Lord, I know that many here have been called by your name. And so, Lord, I'm so thankful to be a part of this church. Lord, I'm thankful for everyone in here. Lord, I'm thankful that, Lord, you have called this body specifically here, this outpost of your kingdom right here in Delray Beach that is bringing radical gospel renewal. 
Lord, may you bless us and keep us. May you always, by the power of your spirit, lead us to a life of faith and repentance. And we pray this in Christ's name. And so as you prepare to go, I'm just going to give you a quick benediction. Is that cool? Good. And so may you all, if you want to receive this benediction, you can lay out your hands if you want. If you're not comfortable doing that, that's okay too. But may you all experience today and forever the peace that comes from knowing and treasuring Jesus above everything else. Amen. Go in peace. Love you guys.